As you see, we have three lovely speakers here, here today, and that one of our speakers is unfortunately not here. She is out sick, um, which is Marion, our senior dietitian. She holds a master's in nutrition and holds advanced certifications in both nutrition support and renal nutrition. Marion covers our SICU and also the TPN team. We have Samantha Simon here, who has a master's in nutrition and is working toward her transplant nutrition certification. She's an integral part, a member of the liver and kidney transplant teams, and also covers the SICU. And of course, we also have Brittany Pick, an athlete. Daniel Levitt, um, who are top graduates from our dietetic internship class last year and recently joined our dietitian team. Ashley covers Five Monty, where she works closely with the interdisciplinary team, and Brittany covers a variety of medicine units with an interest in quality improvement initiatives. So I will let them take it away. Thank you so much. Great. Well, thank you guys for coming. So as mentioned, I'm just going to go over some enteral nutrition and parental nutrition today. So some of our programmer objectives are to understand the scope of enteral nutrition, including the formulas, the feeding tubes, the routes of access, and the methods of administration. We're also going to understand the complementary roles of the dietitian and, the, and how we pair with the nurses in troubleshooting enteral nutrition, challenges in assessing uh, the ad adequacy of enteral nutrition and the modular supports that we use uh, to feed our patients with. Uh, we're also going to talk about the indications for the use of parental nutrition, the components and the routes of administration for that, as well as troubleshooting any problems with parental nutrition. And finally, just identify the best practices for nursing regarding enteral and parental nutrition. We have no disclosures today, and Brittany is going to start us off. Okay. So I'll start us off with an introduction just to enteral nutrition. So what exactly is enteral nutrition composed of? So it's going to be composed of our macronutrients and our micronutrients. So within our macronutrients, we have our proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. So for our protein, our enteral nutrition formulas contain um, intact proteins, hydrolyzed proteins, as well as free amino acids. So they're all varying in size and absorption rates. They also come from both a milk-based and a plant-based protein source allowing for like dietary preferences and also dietary intolerances. Then we have our carbohydrates and our more main form of carbohydrates is our corn maltodextrin. And then we also have prebiotics as well as soluble and insoluble fiber. Then our last macronutrient is gonna be our fats, also known as lipids. So we have long chain triglycerides, which is where we're getting our essential fatty acids from, as well as medium chain triglycerides, which are gonna actually be absorbed quicker than our long chain triglycerides, just because they're a little bit smaller and also have a different means of absorption. Um, and then we have our micronutrients. So those are gonna be our vitamins and minerals. So each enteral nutrition formula has about 24 essential vitamins and minerals to help our patients meet their um, recommended daily allowances of these mi micronutrients. So now just some indications and contraindications of when we would recommend enteral nutrition. So for some indications of enteral nutrition is if say your patient failed a swallow evaluation, you may see in the speech language pathologist note that they recommended non-oral means of nutrition. So that would be where we would recommend enteral nutrition, as well as if say your patient is intubated or say they have a traumatic brain injury or in a coma, as well as any type of like mouth or neck trauma, we would recommend enteral nutrition. Um, we would also recommend enteral nutrition in a form of like a complement to complement meals. So say if a patient isn't meeting adequate estimated nutrient needs, say if they're malnourished or critically ill or have any type of malabsorption disorders, we would recommend initiating enteral nutrition to help meet their needs. So in general, some of the benefits of enteral nutrition that we're providing to our patients, um, one overarching one is that it's going to help preserve the function and structure of our GI tract. And this is doing it by um, maintaining the function of our enterocytes. So these are going to be your, like our intestinal absorptive cells within our GI tract. It's also going to prevent bacterial translocation since with enteral nutrition, we're only maintaining, we're only feeding through the intestinal barrier. So it's allowing it to just be in one place um, if something were to occur. but um, also, it's preventing small intestinal bacterial overgrowth by allowing the patient to be con um, receiving continuous nutrition. And all of these can actually be achieved um, through trophic feeds, which are also commonly called trickle feeds. So this is where a patient is receiving a very small rate of enteral nutrition, even as low as 10 milliliters per hour. Um, so it's always key that we want our patients to be receiving nutrition, even if it's a small amount. Um, and compared to parenteral nutrition, so TPN, um, Enteral nutrition has less risk for complication or infection. 
So some contraindications for enteral nutrition. So this is where we would necessarily not necessarily recommend the patient to be initiated on enteral nutrition or to hold off on feeds would be say if your patient has severe hemodynamic instability, if they have an ileus or any gastro, uh, gastrointestinal ischemia, as well as any high output fistulas or any bowel obstructions. For some bowel obstructions, we're able to feed below the obstruction. However, sometimes it might not be the case where we would still recommend holding off on it. Um, other times would be if they have uh, any episodes of like severe vomiting or diarrhea, as well as GI bleeds. So these are some examples of when we would recommend just holding the feed. So they could still be receiving enteral nutrition. It's just a temporary pause for their um, intervention. So this could be if your patient's on multiple vasopressors um, because we don't want to be able, we don't want to be diverting the blood to the GI tract. We want to be able to maximize the patient's ability to optimize their status, as well as if, say, the patient is receiving spontaneous breathing trials or any type of airway manipulation, as well as if they have any episodes of vomiting, diarrhea, or signs of tube feed intolerance, um, or just in general, we want to be able to optimize their medical standpoint before reinitiating um, enteral nutrition. Um, another reason would be to hold their feeds is if they're having any type of procedure where they have to be NPO beforehand um, or if the tube feed is clogged. Okay, so then now we're going to speak about and roots of administration. Um, so the first one I'm going to speak about is our nasal or oral route, and this is the more common temporary one. This is also called an NG tube or an OG tube, so that's going to be our nasogastric tube or oral gastric tube. There are other tubes that go through the nose and the mouth, but um, and they can end in either the stomach, the small intestine, and those could either be called a nasojejunal tube or a nasoduodenal tube, and vice versa for the oral one. Um, and typically, we recommend this for patients for the short-term period, so about that four to six week window, because prolonged time with an NG tube can actually cause um, nasal damage, so we want to be able to optimize our patient status um, so if there is an indication for long-term nutrition support, there are alternative ones. So these are some of the ones that we would actually recommend for a long-term nutrition support. So we have our gastrostomy tube. So this is also going to be commonly called our PEG. And this one is a tube that's um, inputted through a small incision in the stomach. And the tube just sits in the, the stomach area with the balloon to help keep it in place. And this is where we would be recommending feeding a patient if it's a long-term um, indication. And usually a patient can have a, a PEG tube for multiple years without having to change it if there's no complications. Then we also have our percutaneous endoscopic jejunostomy tube. So this is also similar to the PEG. It's going to be a tube inserted at the stomach, but rather than stopping at the stomach area, it's going to be going all the way into the small intestine, ending at the jejunum. So typically this tube is recommended for patients that may have, may need gastric um, emptying. Um, from like another tube. So we would typically recommend being able to feed below the stomach. Also, if say they have a gastric obstruction or any type of gastric surgery that reduced the size of their stomach, we would typically recommend um, a PEG tube or a J tube. Also, if any patient that has a high risk of aspiration or is on like a high pressure ventilation system, we would recommend um, a, a J tube just because it's gonna lower your risk for aspiration, just because it's a little bit lower down the GI tract. Then we also have our GJ tube. So this is our gastrojejunostomy tube. And this one allows for, it's similar to both the G tube and the J tube, where the tube is still gonna be inserted through your stomach, but there's gonna be, within that one tube, there's one portion that ends in your stomach and another portion that keeps going down into the jejunum within your small intestine. So the G portion is gonna be helping for stomach drainage um, and output, while the J portion is gonna be feeding the patient with enteral nutrition. Um, and then just a little bit to talk about the different types of tubes. We have a smaller version and a larger version. So this one here is going to be our large bore tube, and it's typically used for more of like gastric secretions rather than feeding. Sometimes we would use it for feeding. However, it's a little bit more uncomfortable just because it's stiffer and larger in size compared to our smaller one. Um, but it is less likely to clog just because it is a larger diameter. And then this is our smaller French size tube, and it's called a small bore. Typically, you might see them as also called duo tube or KO feed tube. And these are going to be a little bit more flexible and smaller. So typically, patients tolerate these a lot better. However, with that, you do have that increased risk for occlusion or blockage within the tube. And then with that, um, we're going to now move on to types of enteral nutrition. 
All right, so I'm going to be talking about the types of enteral formulas we have and the modular supplements. I'm sure you see a bunch of different formulas on your units, and um, this kind of will clarify which ones we use for which types of patients. So we have a new product circulating the health system. Um, it's a brand called Kate Farms. Basically, it's a plant-based supplement or tube feeding. Um, it can be used for adult and pediatric nutrition, and it is free of the common allergens. So milk, egg, fish, tree nuts, wheat, soybean, sesame. Um, so it's great if patients have any type of allergies or they're plant-based and don't want um, any other formulas. And basically to order this formula, um, this is more on the provider end, but they can go into the diet order, put in the two feed order as normal, and they'll just free text the type of Kate Farms formula that they would want. Um, and then they would do the Ian provision as normal, the rate, the hours, start time, end time, um, and all that. But that's one of the newer formulas that we have that you might have seen more frequently. So some general use formulas that we have on the units, we have Jevity and now Kate Farms Standard. These are just standard formulas that are used for patients that don't have any types of therapeutic um, restrictions, can be used for patients without diabetes or renal diseases. They contain soluble and insoluble fibers. Um, they're helpful for our elderly patients and they provide regular um, bowel movement regularity. And they also are great for long-term tube feeding use. So these are just our two standard um, formulas that we'll give. not moving. There we go. I don't think I, okay. Um, so these are the formulas that we will use for any like GI surgery, GI distress, malabsorption. So we have Vital over here on the side and then Kate Farms Peptide. Um, so these are semi-elemental formulas. They're easily tolerated in the GI tract and the stomach. They are hydrolyzed peptide-based proteins. Um, they contain MCT oil, which is um, easily absorbed fat and fish oil, which is also anti-inflammatory. So it's got those good anti-inflammatory properties in case anybody's under stress, they have inflammation. Um, they have prebiotics to support gut health. They're low in carbohydrates, so it's glucose friendly, and they're sustainable for patients who have pancreatitis, hyperglycemia from stress or diabetes, or any type of altered GI function. Next, we have our glucose support formulas. So you might have seen our Glucerna or our um, Kate Farms glucose support. So these are slowly digestible carbohydrates in these formulas that will help minimize those peaks in blood sugars. And they're sustainable for managing hyperglycemia, which could be caused by metabolic stress, um, illness, traumas, infections. So these are just our overall glucose-friendly supplements that we'll use if a patient has diabetes or if their sugars are really elevated um, and we kind of want to get them a little bit more under control. Next, we have our renal support formulas. So we have Nepro and Suplena. So Nepro is high in protein for those patients who are on dialysis. They have a bit of an increase in calorie needs, protein needs, and Suplena can be used for patients who have CKD4. They're not on dialysis. Um, and so, you know, these formulas are commonly used for patients who might have AKI, renal failure, um, any type of kidney disease. They're lower in sodium. They are fluid restricted, so the formula is more concentrated. There's a lot more nutrients for the volume that you're getting. Um, they're low in potassium and phosphorus, which are some of the main nutrients that we watch when patients have any type of renal issues. And they have slow release carbohydrates, so they are friendly for patients who might have those crazy sugars or diabetes or anything like that. Next, we have a fluid restricted formula. Um, this is not as used quite often as the others, but this is called Tucal. Um, and it is an extremely nutrient dense formula. Like I said, kind of like the Nepro where you get a lot for your volume. Um, it's high calorie, high protein. It's great for patients who need lower volume feeding. So if they have heart failure, liver failure, um, renal failure, and we're watching their fluid intake, or it could be helpful if patients are malnourished and we need to help with weight gain. Um, they're not able to tolerate large volumes of feeds. So we do a lot more bang for your buck. You, get a smaller volume, but more feeds and nutrients. And then we have our um, formula that we will typically use for trauma, surgery, burns, traumatic brain injuries. Um, these are patients that have, you know, high needs, high calorie, high protein needs, um, but they're also like hydrolyzed, broken down. So we have Kate Farms peptide here as an example, um, high protein, hydrolyzed um, proteins, peptide based. 
they are concentrated in um, calories and nutrients. So if the patient, you know, doesn't need a lot of fluid, you know, it's a, like I said, smaller volume, higher nutrients. Um, they have arginine and glutamine, which provide immune support and help with wound healing if patients have any pressure injuries or wounds or, you know, surgical incisions. Um, and then they also contain MCT oil. Like I said earlier, it's an easily absorbed fat. Uh, fish oil, which has anti-inflammatory properties, contains vitamins and prebiotics to support gut health. Um, so this is just a disclaimer. You might have seen a lot of the formulas are being swapped out on your units. You're not getting a certain formula anymore. You're seeing different ones. So um, we get our formulas from Abbott and Nestle, and we've been having some shortages pretty much system wide. Um, every hospital is kind of going through this issue, but you might see, you know, Vital, Jevity, Glucerna, Nepro. We're swapping them out a lot for the Kate Farms products just because there's been so many shortages. But um, that's just maybe why you've seen less of a certain product and more of another one. But hopefully that'll get resolved soon. <laughs> And then now moving on to the modular supplements we have. So Juven is a supplement that we will commonly recommend if a patient has pressure injuries or needs some extra supplementation for wound healing. Um, so it contains arginine, glutamine, collagen, vitamin C, zinc, B12, all great micronutrients to help with wound healing. And you can mix this product with water if a patient just wants to have it with water, or you can actually mix it with a beverage like apple juice, cranberry juice. Um, it's a little packet. You'll just mix it around and then they drink it. Um, or you can mix it with water and administer it through the feeding tube for a patient who's on enteral feeds. So this is a great supplement. We recommend this a lot. Um, so it's helpful for us if you guys encourage the patients to be drinking it or you help them mix it. Um, that, very, that really helps with wound healing. Then we have ProSource tube feed free and liquid protein supplement. Um, so these are protein supplements for patients who have wounds, malnutrition, trauma, um, critical care patients. So ProSource tube feed has 15 grams of protein and 90 calories. It's a small little packet. It's allergen free, lactose free, vegan. So if your patients are plant based, it's okay. Um, and there's no dilution needed. It's just a straight packet that you can squeeze um, out and you can put it into the tube feeds. Or we have liquid protein supplement, which can be administered via enteral nutrition, or you can actually um, mix it with food, applesauce. Sometimes the patients will even eat it straight out of the packet. Um, this is good for people who might have difficulty feeding themselves a lot and they just want something small to kind of like, you know, just eat really quickly like a gel. This gets them a lot more protein in a shorter period of time. 15 grams of protein, 100 calories, comes in a couple of different flavors. So sometimes I like to offer this if they don't want to have a giant ensure and they're like, I can't really take that much. And so it's it's a good little squeezy pouch for them. And then we have our liquid multivitamins and minerals. So these can be provided through your feeding tubes. Um, you know, it's necessary for patients who are on low volume tube feedings and or who might have wounds um, just to cover their micronutrients. It doesn't hurt. Um, and then we have MCT oil, which is medium chain triglycerides. And these are just easy digestible fats. They can be used for patients who have pilothorax, any sort of lymphatic obstructions or fat malabsorption. And those can be also via oral route or via feeding tube. And now, all right. <laughs> So we're going to talk a little bit about the two feeding rates and the different types of rates that we use in the hospital and actually outside of the hospital. So number one is going to, we're going to talk about continuous feeds. The most common one you will see is a 24 hour feeding cycle. So it runs throughout the day. Um, and many of the medicine units, as well as the surgical ICU uh, use this type of feeding. It allows for lower rates, so better tolerance for the patients, especially those with GI surgery or poor gastric motility. Um, but unfortunately, if the two feeds are held, that means that the EN provision is not going to be met. So this is just something that, you know, we're trying to work on, which is why we're starting to transition to more of 18 hour feeds, which you will start to see in the medical ICU as well as the neurosurgery ICU. And as I mentioned, because of the fact that we're able to hold it for a little longer for things like um, testing or procedures, then they're more likely to re reach the 100 percent of their EN provision. Um, again, this will have to require a higher rate of uh, milliliters per hour, but as I'll talk about a little later, that's not something that these patients necessarily can't tolerate. 
Another type of continuous feeding that you might see is 20 hour feeds. And we use this when it has to do with um, holding for medication purposes. So this is recommended for administration of medications that interact with enteral nutrition. So some examples of those might be Synthroid or uh, Dilantin, which we would have to hold two feeds for about two hours before and after the medication so that they're able to be absorbed. We also have 12, 14, or 16 hour feeds that you might see. Um, with these types of feeds, we have to remember to keep the head of bed elevated at 30 degrees. Um, we, we sometimes call these nocturnal feeds, so we might feed overnight, and that can promote adequate uh, PO intake during the day, but supplemental two feeds at night. Because the head of bed has to be elevated, though, some patients may, you know, request that they aren't, aren't uh, running during the night so they can lay flat to sleep. So that's just something to be mindful and actually talk to your patients about so that we make sure we're getting enough two feeds as well as PO intake. It also can be used to wean off um, from two feeds. So if someone was on a 24 hour cycle or, or an 18 hour cycle of two feeds and we're transitioning to PO feeds, this is a way to kind of segue into that. This is just a sample diet order that we use to show if someone is on maybe like a nocturnal feed or just that partial 16 hour feed. So they have that diet order for pureed as well. They have a peg tube that's going to run for 16 hours. All right, so another type of feeding that we use is bolus feeds. Um, so this is more for PEG or um, NG tubes. We cannot use this for a J tube. Um, so an example order of this would be if we have like cans of Jevity. So they're going to come in the cans this time. They're not going to be, you know, the ready to hang or in the, the kangaroo packs. Um, and they are going to, it could be something like Jevity 1.5 at four cans per day. And we're going to give you kind of an idea of how often to give those. So this mimics more of like a meal time, which can be beneficial if we have medications or if patients want to roam around free or have testing or procedures, this allows for that. This could be given via gravity or syringe, as well as in-house, we can give it through the pump over an hour or two duration. So sometimes bolus feeds are also really beneficial for medications because these medications work best with um, when taken with a meal. So some examples of the medications that I'll be talking about are the pancreatic enzymes, that um, can be given, they need to be given with meals as well as phosphate binders. So for phosphate binder, binders like FASA, we'll just mix the capsule of be, the, the beads of the capsule with 15 milliliters of water and with the syringe, you could give it through the peg. So we really ask a lot, you know, of our nurses. You guys are very, very helpful as well, as well as with our PCAs because you guys play a vital role in making sure that we're doing our job as well. And one of the main parts of our job is helping to diagnose malnutrition. And one of the main criteria for that is inadequate oral or enteral nutrition. So by going into the flow sheets and making sure we're documenting how these EN provisions were given, if they were held or if they were, you know, running for the full duration, um, we're able to go in and kind of calculate if we're getting that right percentage of the enteral nutrition feeds for our patients. And if not, that's when we'll come in and diagnose malnutrition and try to adjust accordingly. So again, you know, we work side by side, so we really appreciate if you guys are taking the time to just document in the flow sheets. Now we're going to change gears a little bit and talk about troubleshooting for enteral nutrition. So um, a big thing that we see in the hospital is diarrhea. Um, a lot of our patients, um, this is just a side effect, and sometimes we love to just blame the tube feeds, but we're here to tell you it's not always the tube feeds. And some other causes of diarrhea might be C. diff, some antibiotic use, sorbitol or other uh, sugar alcohol based medications, um, bowel regimens. Sometimes, you know, the patient just doesn't need the bowel regimen anymore or malabsorption due to some things like short bowel syndrome, pancreatitis or irritable bowel disease. So like I said, is it really the two feeds? Um, probably not. But there are ways that we can kind of intervene if we do feel like they're not tolerating well. Um, so we might suggest a formula that empties from the stomach a little bit, um, you know, more quickly. So it's lower in osmolarity, lower in fat and semi-elemental. So we'll have a, a formula that doesn't contain a lot of fiber, basically. So now we're going to talk about management of diarrhea. So we have some medications like Imodium, which slows GI motility, as well as allows for fluids to be absorbed in the colon. We have Lamodal, which again slows GI motility and reduces frequency of bowel movements and dries up the body fluid. And Sandosatin, which also again inhibits the GI motility, a common theme here, and reduces GI secretions. So some of the supplements that we may use to kind of help 
control diarrhea are some fiber supplements like Banachol. So again, the indication would be that diarrhea because of the C. diff, the antibiotic use, maybe the tube feeds, uh, ostomies or um, you know oncology treatments like chemo that might have side effects of diarrhea. So um, some contraindications for giving this are the small bore tube feeds because we mentioned the actual size of them may cause some clogging. And then the fiber that's used in these are high in insoluble and prebiotic fiber from the banana flakes. So another name for this banana is also banana flakes. You might hear that on the floors. Um, and the administration use is just to mix the pack with 120 milliliters of water via syringe into the tube feed. Um, and then if we are going to use that small bore feed because we don't want to take out that tube, then we could just administer half a pack at a time. Another fiber supplement is Metamucil. This has soluble and insoluble fibers, so this can actually help with constipation or diarrhea. Um, it, it absorbs and retains water to soften the stool, and um, the contraindications again are that small bore tube feed, so just, you know, it may cause some clogging, so we try to avoid giving it when those are in place. So troubleshooting for slow gastric emptying. Um, so pro-motility medications might be that Reglan or erythromycin. Those are sometimes we, we put those on a lot in the ICUs just to promote, um, you know, the, to, to prevent the slow gastric emptying. Um, and then causes of slow motility can be some medications such as opioids. <clears throat> Now I'm going to talk a little bit about NFIT. Um, so this is that purple connector that we're going to see on enteral feeding devices. Um, so you guys might be familiar with that. That's pretty much what we're using system-wide at this point. So what this does, it prevents any misconnections between enteral devices and non-enteral devices. Um, because again, we don't want to hook anything that has to do with nutrition up to like an IV or um, any respiratory support devices. So this is a really good way to kind of prevent that from happening. And I know we mentioned before things like Banachol and the ProSource, and now these are NFIT compatible. So instead of delivering them, you know, through a syringe or anything like that, they actually twist right on with the NFIT connector. So a lot of companies are um, working together to make sure that it's easier for nursing and administering from so that our patients get what they need. So a lot of times, you know, in the hospital, patients have might be a little uh, confused, have some altered mental status. Um, a little agitated, and sometimes that leads to them being a little frustrated and maybe try and pull out the NG tube, which we never want. So what we can do is use a natal bridle, which is an alternative to adhesive, and it secures the NG tube in patients who try to pull them out. So again, that's going to be up to like your discretion, the team's discretion, but this just is a way to kind of prevent that from occurring. Now I'm just going to discuss some uh, professional practice updates that have been going on in our field. So number one, um, we do not really check for gastric residuals anymore. Um, in the past, I know we used to look for that like 200 to 250 cc mark and, um, you know, nurses may have stopped because they thought that was kind of protocol. We're moving away from that because checking gastric residuals can lead to increased clogging. Um, it stops the tube feeds, which is, may not be warranted or necessary. And it also places the patient at um, risk for malnutrition as well as increased harm in general. So as nurses, you guys are always on your game. You're checking for vomiting, abdominal distension, diarrhea, or any like abnormal findings every four hours anyway. So, you, you know, there's no need to really check that gastric residual levels. And also gastric content on an hourly rate. Um, the secretions are 180 milliliters per hour. So, you know, when we're talking about uh, provisions, such as I'm just going to jump around for a minute, like 50 milliliters per hour, that's a fraction of that 188. So, you know, basically our patients can, can tolerate what we're giving them. <laughs> um, to jump back though, the stomach can expand and hold up to four liters of fluid. So, you know, um, four liters is approximately one gallon. So that stomach really does expand. What we're giving them in-house through a continuous feed is nowhere near this. So that minimum, we might think, you know, when we're approaching that almost like 70 milliliter to 80 milliliter per hour mark, you might see like, hey, that might be a lot, but or we can tolerate it. <laughs> and just again, examples of tube feeding rates. So if we're running at 50 milliliters an hour, if we think of a bottle of Venture that we you guys see all the time, that's 237 milliliters that you can chug right down, or even a can of soda is 355 milliliters. So you see the comparison, and it's very, it's a very small rate when we're just breaking it down by that hourly mark. All right, now we're going to switch gears completely. We're going to talk about some parental nutrition, which is just IV nutrition. So 
Um, one bag contains 24 hours of solution, and in this bag will be amino acids, dextrose, electrolytes, multivitamins, trace elements, and insulin if the patient needs it. Um, and then there will be a separate bag for lipids. So there's different uh, routes of administration for parenteral nutrition. We have our central versus our peripheral. In-house, we typically use that uh, central. We don't really do PPN as much, but it, you know, if it's something that's warranted for the patient, the team, the nutrition support team will do it. So when we think of central um, pr pr uh, parental nutrition, we think of maybe like a pick line or something. And although the access route starts on a peripheral site, it ends in a central site, which would be that superior vena cava. So uh, C uh, central lines are able to tolerate higher volumes of uh, osmolarity and can run for longer term, whereas the peripheral, um, you know, they can only really uh, tolerate a very small amount of osmolarity in short term feeding for that because you have to change the axis line a lot um, more frequently than a central line. So indications for parenteral nutrition, this is when, um, you know, there's inadequate absorption, maybe from something like small bowel uh, syndrome, a high output fistula, prolonged bowel rest, uh, and severe malnutrition with, you know, malabsorption. So these are just some indications where enteral nutrition wouldn't be warranted and we need that TPN. Some contraindications for parenteral nutrition are bacteremia or line sepsis because of the central line or the line access. Anything anticipated for, you know, you won't really need it for anything less than seven days. It really doesn't warrant placing a line. Maybe hyperglycemia, which can be glucose levels over 300. Severe metabolic in instability, electrolyte, um, you know, imbalances, as well as inappropriate uh, goals of care. So it's really important to talk to your patients, talk to the team, and see if this is something they even really want. Bottom line is, if the gut works, we want to use it. Um, so, you know, if they can't eat, then our, sec then our next move is going to be enteral nutrition. And if then that doesn't work, that's when we're going to go to that TPN. So reading the uh, parental nutrition orders is a little bit different than regular diet orders. So you're going to see lipids hang separately, and you're going to see a separate order for that. Um, so highlighted up on the on the right, the top right, we have the lipid fat emulsion, and these are going to run for about eight to twelve hours. Whereas the larger yellow bag can be hung up to twenty four hours, um, and this contains our our dextrose, our amino acids, and all our our micronutrients as well as our insulin. And this will be uh, the second part of that diet order underneath the IV nutrition. So sometimes we run for even shorter than 24 hours. And when this occurs, we actually have to start at a lower rate and titrate to goal. And then when we're coming off of it, we have to titrate back down just to make sure that the patient, you know, we're, we're running smoothly. We don't get hypoglycemic and we kind of titrate off. So we can't just stop it cold at the um, goal rate. We have to come down a little bit. So you can see this is running for 16 hours. We're going to start at that 75 uh, milliliters per hour. We're going to reach the goal of 96 and then come back down to 75. So just some safe practices when it comes to parental nutrition. Again, it is an IV access, so we have to be very careful. Um, so we're going to order those uh, chlorhexidine wipes, make sure we're cleaning the lines appropriately, which I know you guys know how to do, but we just want to make sure that that is in the order um, for our patients. And then just some troubleshooting for parental nutrition. So anytime parental nutrition is shut off, we need to run D10 to make sure our patients don't go hypoglycemic. Um, and then if there is insulin present in the TPN bag, because as I mentioned, some of our patients um, will require insulin and that can be directly in the order form, then we just have to check our blood sugar levels every four hours. And then if the patient is going to the OR, we do not have to stop uh, parental nutrition. Total T TPN can run through their OR um, operation and then back continue when they get back to the floor. So some troubleshooting with lipids is, that, like I mentioned, the lipids run for about 8 to 12 hours via a 1.2 micron filter. The bags are kind of pre-made, so they can come in 100 milliliters, 250 milliliters, or 500 milliliters. And sometimes you may require more than one bag. So, you know, you'll have your, your yellow bag and then maybe two lipid bags next to it. Um, and lipids should stop after the prescribed amount of hours. So there may be some uh, of the lipids still left in the bag, but that does not mean to run it through completely. And then 
troubleshooting with labs is sometimes you may see some discrepancy in labs, and this might be because um, it was contaminated from the TPN. So when this happens, as you can see, like the sodium, the potassium is all very off, not really trending to what the previous labs were going to were, were um, early in the day. So you're going to stop the TPN for about 10 minutes. You're going to discard the first one to two blood samples and redraw once the TPN is kind of cleared out to get a better idea of what the labs are really looking like, especially those electrolytes. And anytime you have any questions or anything about TPN, you can contact the nutrition support team. They have a PA and up top is the spectra for them, as well as our dietitians on the nutrition support team, Marion and Allison, they can be reached via Teams. Um, and then any inquiries after hour, or if you have any problems with pharmacy, you can call the, the pharmacy line. Those are some of our references. And thank you. Any